Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in about two minutes. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in a little less than two minutes. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in a little less than two minutes. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in about a minute. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in just a few seconds, about 30 seconds. Letting everybody come in. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in just a few seconds. Okay, we'll get started. Hope you had a wonderful summer weekend and the weather's treating you okay out on the East Coast. It looks like you're a little wet, but we're uh, hopefully getting some sunshine soon. So we'll go ahead and get started. Some fun topics to cover today. First of all, this is uh, something that uh, I do not like Medicare. I don't like talking about it, confusing with etc. But here's the thing: some of the most successful advisors on the system have really leveraged this to to uh, <laughs> basically explode their clientele in a good way and bring on hundreds of people uh, over a couple of year time period. So I want to talk about this not just because it's great marketing, but also because you know we have a responsibility. Medicare is a huge part of our clients uh, financial needs and we need to be uh, address that. And so I came across this article I thought I would run through it and then tell you how you can leverage it. So three reasons your clients need Medicare advice. Number one, clients don't want to trust someone new. They have to, <laughs> When they start to talk to agents about Medicare, they're always worried, is this guy just taking advantage of me? So they, they, people don't like to talk to somebody new. They want to talk to you. Oh, can you hear me, uh, uh, Allie? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so uh, we had somebody say they were having audio problems, so. Uh, number two, clients just don't understand healthcare. They don't, I mean, I don't understand healthcare or Medicare. It's a, it's a tough, complicated subject. Number three, clients are worried health expenses will cause them to outlive their money. So these are the three reasons why we need to be talking about this. And I'm sorry, Allie, but you're talking to Andre to figure out how to fix that for him? Yes, I'm going to message him right now. Super duper. Thank you. But many of you are probably saying, but Mike, I don't understand Medicare. I know. I don't understand it either. So there are ways around that. So just because we don't understand something, if it's important to our clients, answer this guy, yay or nay. Just because we don't understand something, if it's an important financial need to our clients, should we figure uh, either learn to understand it or figure a workaround, yay or nay? Or should we just say, I, I don't get that. I, it's, not, it's not really my problem. Yeah, we have to. We have to have to figure out how to fix that. So let's talk about some workarounds, okay? Number one, if you go back to our uh, library, coaching call replays, 7, 10, 23, I, I actually spent a whole call talking about this. You don't have to be a Medicare expert to give your clients good advice on Medicare. Number two, is this um, uh, relationship we have with I-65. So if you go to the uh, resources and look at Medicare, I-65 is an awesome resource for advisors who know nothing about 
Medicare. That allows you to, they have a, a awesome seminar on Medicare that any one of you guys could give to your clients, to your prospects, to a church group, to a senior group, to a VFW, to a Rotary Club, to a Lions Club. It's an awesome presentation on Medicare that you can give because you don't need to know anything about Medicare to give it. So this is a way for you to start leveraging uh, Medicare to get in front of new people. So please uh, take a look at this. Even if you don't want to do it, because you think, I don't know how to do it, look at their stuff, and I think you'll be uh, uh, pleased or surprised at how easy it actually is to come across. Because, guys, <laughs> if you do this, how much more about Medicare will you know than your clients or your prospects? If all you did was learn this seminar, and the seminar is super easy to learn, how much more will you know than your clients or prospects? A ton more, which makes you a what? If you know a ton more, I don't care if you're an expert compared to some other Medicare person, but if, you're a, uh, if you know a lot more than the prospects and clients, that makes you a what? An expert. Yes, an expert to them. So this is a fantastic way to start leveraging this. And it's the best marketing strategy ever. Like I, 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 I uh, mentioned here a few minutes ago, I've had guys that what they've done is during the sign-up period, in, the late, in fall and late fall, they would bring on 100 new Medicare clients, 100 new Medicare clients. We had one uh, uh, partnership in Idaho. They brought on 700, 700 new clients during the fall season. Guess what that, that uh, partnership did for the next two years? They didn't spend a single cent on marketing. They simply went back to that 700 people and marketed to them. They had their two biggest years in their uh, careers. And how much did that cost them to market, guys? How much did it cost when they did these Medicare seminars and brought on Medicare clients? How much did it cost them to market? That's the beauty of this, this strategy. How much did it cost them to market? Put your thinking caps on. How much did it cost them to market for Medicare? It's a trick question. Because obviously you don't know how much they spent, but what do you know? When somebody became a Medicare client, did they get paid? Yes. So actually they were being paid. They, they were not paying out to market. Yes, they, they paid out to market to get new Medicare clients, but they made more. They made everything that they spent on marketing back and then a lot more by making those Medicare people their clients. Their, I'm sorry, their Medicare clients. And then, so, so they marketed for Medicare. Then they sold Medicare Advantage plans and made money. So the marketing cost how much? Nothing. They actually got paid to market. And then they turn around and leverage that into financial advisory clients. So do you see how this can be a... a, a a way to market where you don't even get have to pay. You actually get paid to market to find new advisor clients. Now, obviously, they weren't they weren't making a ton of money. Uh, they, they made good money. They made decent money. They made about seventy grand bringing um, bringing those Medicare clients on. But then, so they got paid. But think about this: they got paid seventy grand to find seven hundred people to then turn around and have their two biggest years as advisors. They're two biggest years as advisors, making hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so it cost them nothing to market because they simply leveraged their Medicare clients into advisory clients. Does that make sense? Mine the money in your backyard. Now, let's say you don't want to do that. Well, then don't do that. Find a Medicare person that you can trust and partner up with them. Because you can still do these seminars. Still do these seminars and then just refer them out to another person. But could could you have an agreement with that person then for them to endorse you for advisory clients? Yes, and they already know you because you did the seminar. Does that make sense? And how many entities do you think? I mean, do you think there are churches out there that wouldn't mind you doing seminars on Medicare? Especially if you don't actually sell Medicare and you can tell them, I don't even have a license to sell Medicare. I'm just an expert on retiring uh, on retirement issues. 
are there entities out there that would want to help their membership understand Medicare better? Yes, there are. So this is a great way to do it too. If you don't want to be your own expert, then find an expert because does that satisfy the clients don't know who to trust? If they trust you and you vetted the person, that gives them confidence that that person is trustworthy. They don't understand healthcare. Well, you've helped them understand it and now you've brought on an expert partner to help them understand it better. Clients are worried to death that, uh, that health expenses will cause them to outlive their money. Have we helped them with that? Does that make sense? So please, please, please do not ignore Medicare. Do not ignore Medicare. Get out there and either become an, uh, 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 knowledgeable yourself or find a partner to do it for you. So today I want to talk about the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The reason I bring this up was about five years ago at one of my on-site trainings, I had an, a, a guy come up after, after the training says, Mike, uh, <laughs> it, I, I was laughing while you were doing the training the last couple of days. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I'm an ex-FBI agent. I'm a retired FBI agent. And I was actually in, uh, spent five, the last five years in the FBI as a negotiator for the FBI. And every single uh, uh, technique that you're talking about is the exact technique that we use as FBI negotiators. So let me ask you this, guys. If this, if the techniques work uh, when dealing with a, uh, <laughs> somebody in a high stress situation, is it going to work for our clients? If it's dealing with a robbery uh, in progress, is it going to work for clients? If it's de dealing with a hostage uh, situation, will it work for our clients, do you think? Is, do you think a hostage situation is harder or easier than we sit down with clients? Which one? H for harder, E for easier. Is a hostage situation harder or easier than when we're with clients? Somebody give an H or an E. Yeah, easier. Well, no, no, no. Working with our clients is easier. Maybe I asked that backwards. Working with our clients is going to be way easier than in a hostage situation. Can we agree on that? Yes. So what do we do that the, the Bureau of, uh, uh, of Investigation, Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI does for negotiation? How do we use the same techniques they use? Well, let's look at this. Here are the five strategies of FBI negotiators. Number one, repeat the last three words you hear. Where do we do that in the system? Guys, where do we do that? Where do we repeat the last three words we hear in the system? Get your thinking caps on. Where do we do that? Ape. Very good. Ape, 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 ape. Yep, it's parroting, parroting. So ape, agree, parrot, empower. And parroting means say the exact same words back that they say. Parroting. We do it there. Very good, guys. Expose negative thoughts to daylight. Where do we do that, guys? Where do we expose negative thoughts to daylight? Where do we expose negative thoughts to daylight? When they give us an objection, what do we do? We tell them why they're what? Right. If they say annuities are bad, what do we say? Hell yeah, annuities are bad. If they say, um, um, I can't leave my guy, we say, of course you can't leave your guy. See, uh, so we, when they give us a negative thought, we actually start uh, being a proponent for their negative thoughts. We explain all the reasons what they just said is right. So we do that. Think through how you will speak, not just what you will say. Think through how, how, how you speak. Not just the words, but how you present the words, how you speak the words. Do I encourage you to ch change your tonation, your volume, your speed when you're speaking with people? When I'm doing the non-financial things, when I'm doing the non-financial things, what do I, how do I change my tonation at the end? Say, you know, I know you're probably wondering at this point, why is Mike covering this boring, putsy stuff? You're scratching your head saying, let's get to the fun stuff. Enough with this icky stuff I don't even want to talk about, you know, and to be honest with you, I scratch my head too because do I even get paid? Do I even get paid to do this stuff? Do I get paid to help you with your power of attorney with Social Security? No. So, so 
I scratched my head and went, guys, how does that sound compared to, you're probably wondering why I cover these things. You know, sometimes I'm wondering too, because do I get paid for doing this? <laughs> Is there a difference in the tonation between those two different ways of doing it? And what am I communicating the first way? That I'm pained to even be covered. So I know that you, you're paying to listen to this stuff and talk about this stuff, but I'm paying too. I don't want to be talking about any more news. Am I communicating that in how I'm speaking? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So there, we have lots of examples of that uh, through the system. Ask questions that encourage them to solve the problem for you. Where do we do that, guys? Ask questions that encourage them to uh, um, solve the problem for us. Where do we do that? How about everywhere? Do not tell, do not sell, do not preach, do not teach. Let them tell you. There's only one person they believe 100% of the time. And who's that? Themselves. The we, our whole system is designed around asking questions that get them to encourage. Because guys, if you if you tell somebody that they've worked with for for 10 years, who they think is their best friend, who they think walks on water, and you tell them that guy is screwing them, what is their knee jerk reaction? If you tell them their guy is screwing them for an hour and a half, what would their knee jerk reaction be? What would their knee jerk reaction be? No, nope, they're not going to leave their guy, Dale. If you tell them for an hour and a half that their guy is screwing them, what is their knee jerk reaction going to be? Guys, I made 50 grand a year for eight years telling them they should leave their guy, proving that they should leave their guy, preaching to them, that's right, June. That's right, June. They get defensive. That's right, Nick. They get defensive. The knee-jerk reaction is to get defensive. And why? Why are they getting defensive? Are they really getting defensive for their guy? Why are they getting defensive? Because they're the one that chose their guy. So if their guy is really screwing them, who's the idiot here, their guy or them? Yeah, Tom, they're protecting themselves and their own. Uh, so we cannot, here's the thing. I can call, many times in my life, I'll say I'm an idiot. I, I, I shake my, guys, have you, give, give me some yeas or nays of this. Have you in your life ever done something where you shook your head and said that was a stupid thing to do? That was idiotic. Talking to yourself. Have, I want everybody on the phone call to answer. Have you ever in your life done something and you, and you think to yourself, that was stupid, that was idiotic, what the heck? was I thinking? So June said yes. Thank you, June, for being honest. None of you guys, other guys have done this. So you're all perfect. <laughs> have you ever done that in your life where you've said, uh, yeah, we're, are we talking about yes, exactly. We've all done that. We've all said that. But here's the thing, June. If somebody calls you an idiot, then what do you do? If somebody calls you an idiot, then what do you do? Say, yeah, 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 I'm an idiot. Or do you get defensive? I know if somebody calls me an idiot, even if I know I'm an idiot, if somebody calls me an idiot, I'm going to get defensive. I'm going to fight back. Yes. So we have to ask them questions where they come to their own conclusion that their guy is screwing them. See, they, they, can, they can discover for themselves their guy is screwing them because they don't have to feel bad. They, they think, oh, I've discovered this. I'm angry at that guy. I'm disgusted with that guy. But I discovered it. And I'm mad, mad. But if I point it out, they have to say, yeah, I guess I was an idiot. See, they don't have to do it if they discover it for themselves. If they discover it for themselves. Number five, don't give up until you've at least tried the, oh, well, I guess we're done here. Now, this, is a, this would be a highly advanced question for you to be able to answer. I did talk about this about a month ago, but I'm going to go over it right now. Don't give up until you've at least tried, oh, well, I guess we're done here. So, if somebody's being... Uh, Overly, like especially at a first meeting, uh, argumentative. Because is, am I? Do I sell anything at the first meeting? Do I uh, propose that they do anything at the first meeting? Do I propose that they move their money? At the, if if, I, if they're defensive and they're argumentative, eventually, what do I do? I say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Apparently, something that I did, something that I said, something that I referred to upset you, made you angry. And I apologize for that. So what I don't, I'm not sure what it was, but whatever I did, said, inferred, I apologize. That's my fault. 
uh, I did not mean to do it. I'm here to help, not hurt. I'm here to uh, help you work through problems, not to cause more problems. So I'm sorry, but whatever I've done to upset you, I hope you understand it wasn't done on purpose, and I apologize for that. And then I shut up. I don't say a word. Now, the, the three years I was in private practice, and I did I probably used this technique maybe six, seven times. The funny thing is the, the, longest, the longest I had to shut up for was two minutes. Guys, do you know how long two minutes of silence is? Because I sat there. I sat there after I said that. So I'm sorry. So whatever I did, I apologize. And then I shut up. And the longest was two minutes. So I just want to give you an example of this. I'm going to go for 30 seconds. And you see how long this 30 seconds is. Me sitting on one side of the desk, the client sitting on the other side of the desk. So I say, I'm, so whatever I did, I, I hope you understand. I didn't mean to. I'm here to, <laughs> to make your life easier, not to cause more problems. So whatever I did, I apologize. That's 30 seconds, guys, and we went two minutes. Them looking at me and me looking at them. Because at that point, first of all, do I have any, if they're being a jerk, because I'm not selling anything, I'm not asking them to do anything, <laughs> uh, and they're still being a jerk and defensive, I'm wondering, why did you even bother coming in? So, so guys, that was 30 seconds. And I went for two minutes. Because I have a, remember, I have a clock sitting right behind them so I can keep on track, so I can see the two minutes. So when I was silent like that, I was waiting for them to what? Explain themselves. And finally, the, person, the guy burst out laughing and said, okay, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just, you know, I, I'm always worried about you guys. You're always trying to push your agenda. You're always trying to do this. You're always, you know. And so he started to explain himself on why he was being such a jerk. And I said, no, no, I get it. Help me understand, because I certainly don't want to push my agenda. So what agenda have I been pushing? Well, well, you really haven't yet. I just, you know, I wanted to be clear that I don't want you to. Hey, I, you see, guys, when I do that, it forces them to what? To explain themselves, why they're being jerks. So that's where I, I don't give up until, or if if uh, if I'm in the middle of a a, a 20 point checklist and they're being a jerk over nothing, when I'm just trying to so, oh, you know, let's oh, give you an example. Because some of you say this, and this happens to some of you, where you say, because uh, you're not very good at got yet. So when you're asking all these questions, they get defensive. They, you know, why are you asking all these questions? Tell, just tell them, make your point. They, they get angry at, at me asking all these questions if I haven't gotten good at got camouflaging or patting them on the back for all the good answers. So when they do that, what do I do? I say, oh, I'm sorry. You must feel like you're getting the third degree here. I, that's not what I meant. That's not, and again, it's probably because I'm not as, a, as, a, as good a communicator as I should be. The reason I'm asking a lot of questions is, do I know uh, everything about you, what you like and what you don't like? Uh, do I have a, a, a crystal ball that I can see into your head? You know, your neighbor. Are you and your neighbor exactly the same? How about your neighbor on the other side? Are you exactly the same to them? Is there anybody in your block that are exactly the same as somebody else? No. Just, does everybody like the same thing? No. Does everybody not like the uh, same thing? No. Does everybody have the same risk tone? Yeah. So if I don't know you and I start making assumptions, what if, the, you know, we've all heard the joke, when I assume something, what? That's right. Makes an ass out of you and me. So I've learned not, so I apologize for all these questions. It must be irritating as heck to you, I apologize. But I don't want to be an ass to you or to me. So the only way I would know what's going on in your head, what you like or don't like, is if you tell me what? What I like and don't like. Yeah, because otherwise, I'm going to be making assumptions. And do you want something tailored for you? You want something 
one size fits all. I'm assuming that's how you buy your shoes, one size fits all, or do you get tailored shoes? Or tailored shoes. So if I start making assumptions and say, oh, this will work great for you without knowing everything about you, is that a good advisor or is that somebody selling something? Is that a salesman? Well, that'd be more like a salesman. And the people that come to me, they want, even though I'm clumsy, even though I ask a lot of questions, even though it can get irritating, the reason I'm doing that is what? To know more about you or less about you? No, to know more about me. So I do apologize for all the questions, but the more I know about you, the better or the worse I can make recommendations. No, the better. So yeah, I'm uh, uh, sitting on your side of the table. I get, hey, stop with the third degree, but why am I giving you the quote unquote third degree? Well, to, to understand us better and, and to give better recommendations. Yeah, that, that's why I do it. So I understand it. I'll, I'll try to do it the least amount possible, but I'm going to have to do what in order to find out more about you? We'll ask questions. So then who told them, who told them that it was okay to ask questions? Who told them then that it was okay to ask questions? Who just told them that it was okay to ask questions and that it was necessary to ask questions? That's right. They told, they told themselves. So we are using all these techniques. So let's walk through some of these uh, in additional. Got. Okay. We agree. We pair it in power. We pair it where we say that the exact same three words, just like they said for, uh, in the negotiating, um, um, the five characters of, the, of a good negotiation with, in the FBI rule book is to repeat back the last three words. So do I uh, paraphrase them or do I say them exactly? You say them exactly back. If they say the market, uh, well, the market would go down. I say, yeah, that's right. The market was probably not going to uh, uh, go down a lot. But it's going to go down a little bit. And da, 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 da. No, that's not what you do. You do not paraphrase. And, and they've done experiments on this with, with waitresses and waiters. And this has been du uh, duplicated many, many times. If a waiter says back exactly what you say to them, word for word exact, as compared to a waiter paraphrases what you said, word for word exact, paraphrasing. They're both the same, but with the exact, tips went up by 17%. And this has been duplicated over and over and over again. When you repeat back the exact same words, tips went up by 17% versus paraphrasing. And the reason they think that this is the case is when you paraphrase, so if they say, well, I think the market's going to go down. And you say, right, the market, the market's certainly not going to go up. I mean, it's going to go down, and the reason it's going to go down is because da, 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 da. And you start go, going on and on and on. What have you just said about their question that it was a, or their answer, that it was a good answer or wasn't good enough, and you have to, to explain to them what's – you know, it's kind of like mansplaining. When you paraphrase, it's like mansplaining. <laughs> where's where's the – the, the, the people that said the market's going to go down and you start to explain to them why the market's going to go down. They're like, yeah, I know that. That's why I said the market will go down. But that's why you don't paraphrase. That's why parrot means, because P in paraphrasing also starts with P, but instead it says what? Parrot. Say the exact same words. And now we know, now we know that there's a science behind it in that the FBI <laughs> strategy does repeat the last three words. So there's lots of reasons why and proof that that works. The parrot, 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 not paraphrase, parrot. And it gets people talking. Why does it get people talking? Because you're giving them verbal pats on the back that they're smart. When you agree with them, they're smart. When you parrot back, you're saying they're smart. I hear you and you, what you said is exactly right. And then when you empower them, tell them they're above average, it gets people talking. And that's what you want in an FBI negotiation. And that's what we want in, in a 21-point checklist. And it also, if they have negative thoughts, guess what we have to do? If they have negative thoughts, we have to air them. We have to put them on the table. We don't ignore them. We don't ignore them. For example, with our FIA presentation, do we know that many people, when they think of annuities, think that they're not liquid, yay or nay? Do we know that? Do we know that most people think that annuities are not liquid? Yes. So should I hide from that or should I weave it into the conversation so they can clarify in their mind that yes, they're not perfectly liquid, but they're a lot more liquid than money managers. They're a lot more liquid than guaranteed accounts. They're a lot more liquid than, so I let them, what? Explain to themselves why yes, they're not perfectly liquid, but they're a lot more liquid than that money manager where I have most of my money right now. 
So I, I don't hide from it. I hit it what? I take it direct on. I just have, happen to have them frame it in a mindset. They're like, oh, yeah, I, I never thought of it that way. That's exactly right. So the negative things, I don't hide from them. I put them on the table, just like when they give me an objection. Do I hide from them or do I start to explain to them why they're right? I explain why they're right. So don't hide from the negative stuff because will the negative stuff ever go away? Well, the negative stuff, if I pretend like, uh, if they don't bring up liquidity with an annuity, does that mean they're not worried about it? If they don't bring up liquidity with annuity, does that mean they're not worried about it? No. It means that they're just not brave enough or don't want to get in an argument with you. So they just won't bring it up. So I know they're thinking it. Don't let it sit there. Bring it out and put it on the table. Does that make sense? And then that's behind negotiators do the same thing. They talk about the worst case scenario to get it out there on the table. Don't run away from your problem. It's the only one of the, it's one of the only races you'll never be able to win. Should I run away from a, an objection they give me? No. Should I run away from a belief that they have? No, I have to get it out there. We have to discuss it. And I have to let them explain to me why that is no longer, no longer an issue. Make sense? And I'm never going to assume that I know what's going on in their head. They have to tell me. I have to ask them questions so they tell me what's going on in their head. So when we're handling objections, first thing I do is agree with them. Agree, agree, agree. Why? Because it changes the paradigm. Because when they, when they give me an objection, they think I'm going to fight them. So their fight, fight goes up, their pulse rate goes up, their breath rate goes up, and their listening goes down. When somebody gives me an objection, my pulse rate goes up. My breath rate goes up. My ability to listen goes down. So we have to stop me and the client from going into this fight, fight mode. The easiest way to, for that, for, to do that is for me to train myself to say absolutely. So when they say something I totally disagree with, I say absolutely. And when I say absolutely to what they say, what, what happens in their head? They're like, brr, 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 what did you just say? I thought you were going to argue with me, but instead you're saying absolutely? What's going on here? It makes them stop out of the, get out of the fight, drop out of the fight, flight, and start to wonder, wait, what's going on here? What did he just say? I can't believe what he just said. See, that's changing their whole mindset, and they now become curious. Why did he agree with me? That seems odd. And it turns them into a listening mode versus a fighting mode. So it's the same way they do with the FBI agent. And we accentuate the positive? No, we accentuate what? The negative. Accentuate the negative. What do we mean by that? <laughs> how, how much time during an FIA presentation do I spend expounding the, the how wonderful FIAs are? Is there any part of the FIA where we talk about how great it is? Is there any single part of an FIA presentation where I talk about how great an FIA is? Yay or nay? I want everybody to answer that. Yay or nay? Ah, see, everybody's getting it. I never do. I say, first thing I talk about is what? Rates of return. Do I tell them that the rate of return on an FI is great, or I tell them it's never the right place to be? It's always the second best place to be. So is that, am I talking about how great the return on an FIA is when I say it's never the right place to be? Then down market guarantees the best place to be. In up market, <laughs> the market's the best place to be. In flat market, a guaranteed is the right place to be. So you're never the right place. You're always the second best place. So I'm not promoting that. I'm promoting the negative that you're never the right place to be. How about with, with um, uh, fees? Do I ever say, hey, this is no cost? Because I've heard, guys, have you heard advisors say that annuities are no cost or there's no fee? Is that a lie or not a lie? So say if somebody, if an advisor says that um, uh, an annuity has no fees, give me an L for a lie. And N for not a lie. L for a lie, N for not a lie. All right, guys. Oh, we must have some guys in here that are saying that because you're afraid to answer and say L. That's a friggin' lie. Are there fees with annuity? Yes. Can a company be in front, can be in business? Can, can a company be in business and not fees? So do I hide from that or do I talk about the fees? 
in the FI press. I talk about the fees. We say what? When the market is, when you're making a lot of money, the fees are high. When you're making a low, uh, less money, the fees are low. Is that more or less fair than a money manager who charges the same high fees whether the market's going up, flat, or down? You get charged the same amount of fees. Or would you rather be, when the market's up, you pay a lot. When the market's up a little, you pay a little. And when the market's down, you pay nothing. Which one's more fair? See, do I hide from that? No. Because fees are negative, but I wa we walked through that. How about liquidity? We just did that. Uh, um, uh, or talked about that before, which is with the <laughs> liquidity. I don't hide from that. It's part of the presentation. So do I, am I accentuating the, ne the positive and negative? I'm, no, I'm thinking, here's the negative things. Here's the negative things about annuities. But when we look at the negative things about annuities, is it more or is it less negative than a money manager? And what is it, when it comes to rates of return, is the return more or less negative than a money manager? And they tell me less negative, what, 10, 15 times. When I say, hey, when, when we talk about the um, uh, liquidity, is it more or less liquid than a money manager? No, it's a, a lot more liquid than a, a money manager. When we talk about fees, is it more or less fair than a money manager? No, it's less fair. I mean, sorry, FI is way more fair than a money manager when it comes to fees. See, I don't hide from the negatives. I bring them up to make sure, because do I want them going through the negatives in their house or do I want them going through the negatives in front of me so I can coach them through it? Do I want them doing it in their house when they go home or in the car when they go home or when they think about it at night? Or do I want them to do, walk through that right in front of me? I want them to walk through it right in front of me. Does that make sense? Think through how you will speak, not just what you will say, and I gave you an example of that before. With the kind of whiny stuff, you know, during the non-financial where I apologize for covering this icky, putty, boring stuff. I changed the type of voice I use. Also, guys, in normal life, do I speak fast or do I speak slow? Fast or slow? In normal life. When I'm talking to you guys, when I'm coaching, when I'm explaining something, do I talk fast or slow? Fast. Fast, fast, fast. I talk super fast. When I'm with a client, guess how fast I talk? I don't. I slow it way down. How do you think I fix that? How do you think? Because, you know, being in front of a client, you're nervous, things are going on, you're juggling six balls in the air at one time, so you're going to revert back to your normal self. How did I fix myself from talking so fast in front of clients? How did I fix that? And that was one of the main problems I had. Many people would say, you're like a fast-talking salesman. You're like a fast-talking salesman. Yeah, you seem to make sense. You seem to be talking uh, th things that would put us in a better position, but I, I don't know. We just seem like you're, you've got this, you're so smooth, you're fast-talking, I don't trust you. <laughs> and I had people tell me that. That's right. That's right, June. Recording, recording, recording. Doing my 15-minute drill slowed me down because when I was talking with a client, I knew I was recording myself. I'd make sure that that's what I would work on. So before a meeting, if that's what I covered in the in the, my 15 minute drill that day, and I found I was talking too fast, I'd say, well, I don't care what else I do today in these meetings, but the one thing I am going to do is talk slower. So today I've covered my 15 minute drill. I'm covering. I'm talking way too fast. So the one thing I'm going to concentrate on in my meeting today is to talk slower. I don't care. Maybe I don't ask, ask all the questions I need to. Maybe I make a, a dozen other mistakes. But the one mistake I will not make is talking fast. I will talk slower. And that's how you do it. You record. That's, that's the importance of doing the 15-minute drill. So you're constantly aware of the mistakes you're making. Any per point worth making must be made by them. How many statements do I make in an hour and a half, 21-point checklist? How many statements do I make? How many statements do I make in an hour and a half, 21-point checklist? My, Nick says zero. I, my goal is zero. I think when, if, you listen to the, if you listen to the or watch that video, me doing the 21-point checklist with Jeff, I think you'll find I make seven. An hour and a half, I make seven statements. Guess how many questions I ask during that hour and a half? Over 350. Yep, Tom, 300 plus. Three, over 350 questions, seven statements. If that's the case, 
who's making the point that they should leave their advisor? If I make seven statements and they, and they answer 350 plus questions, who's telling them they should leave their advisor? They're telling themselves. Frame my question. Here's a great example of framing my question. I never ask a question, I never ask a question that I don't know how they're gonna answer. And remember, I've talked about this before. When we're, we're covering each one of those, uh, at the end of each coaching call, when we're doing this for a couple of years, where we're covering <clears throat> each script and I say, okay, now, is Jeff answering it because he wants to be easy on me, because he wants to make it friendly to me, or is he answering the same way every other client would answer? And you all tell me and agree that no, that's exactly how a client would answer. It's because that's the way I frame the question. An example would be if I say, hey, are you aggressive or are you uh, conservative uh, or are you someplace in the middle? Could some people, give me a year and a, could some people say aggressive? Could some people say conservative? If I said, hey, are you more aggressive, conservative, or in the middle? Yeah, a lot of people say in the middle, but could some people say aggressive? Could some people say uh, conservative? Yes, I don't want them to say that. So how do I make sure they don't? I say, so if, you ever, if, if we had a race, have you ever heard of a bell curve? Well, here's an example of that. If we have a race and it's a bunch of 50-year-old men, will they all cross the finish line at the same time? Well, no, they won't. Okay. So that, some of them are going to finish what? And some of them are going to finish what? Well, some are going to finish faster, some are going to finish slower. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so if we look at a bell curve, it goes like this. The vast majority of people are going to finish fast, are going to finish slow, or are going to be somewhere in the middle. No, they're going to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah, that's why they call it bell curve, because most people are somewhere here in the middle. Now, there's going to be this tail here. This is the fast people. So are a lot of people fast or just a few? No, just a few. Over here, it's the slow people. Is a lot of people fast or, or slow or is a, lot, uh, a few people? Just a few, yeah. But the vast majority are what? Well, they're right in the middle, yeah. So and it's the same way when it comes to money. Some people are conservative. Some people are aggressive. Most people are in the middle. You know, ag aggressive people, they're taking their Social Security check. They go down to the casino and they put it on red every single uh, month. And then the conservative people, they take their Social Security check, change it into gold and bury it in the backyard. But most people are what? Uh, in the middle, most people are in the middle, yeah. So would you say you're the kind of people that go the, uh, the <laughs> aggressive and take your, you know, go, go bet your secure check every month or do you bury it in the backyard or would you consider yourself more in the middle? What do 100% of people say when I do it that way? When I frame the question that way, what does 100% of the people say? They're in the middle. And I want them to say they're in the middle because what is it? what's an FIA? Is, it, is FIA really aggressive? Is it really conservative or somewhere in the middle? It's in the middle. So I'm, I have them say that. Also, during the 21 point <clears throat> checklist I, is where I actually do the bell curve. Why do we want them to say it there? Because we find out most clients, 95% of clients are what? When we look at their portfolios, 95% of clients are what? When we look at the stocks they have and the bonds they have, and they realize that bonds are not safe, because we walk them through that, they tell they themselves tell us bonds are not safe, which means what percentage what percentage of their portfolio is aggressive then? A high or a low amount? H for high, L for low. 95% of people, do you find they're too, they have too little in the market or they have too much in the market when you consider stocks and bonds are both what? Guys, are bonds, unless you're buying an actual bond, a one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year, five-year bond, if you're buying anything else other than a five-year bond or less in maturity, is a bond safe? Is a bond safe? No. So most people have stocks and bonds. So where are they? They're too aggressive. So I, I have to have them say that they don't want to be aggressive. They don't want to be safe. They want to be in the middle. And when we, so that they can see that their current uh, diversification is too aggressive. Head off objections. Guys, what is the whole purpose of the script? To head off objections. And pacing and volume, we just talked about talking slower. Volume, what happened to my volume when I talk about the non-financial? What happens to the volume of my voice when I'm talking about the non-financial? Does the volume go up or does it go down? It goes down. It goes down. I know you're probably scratching your head and wondering, why does he keep coming? I want to talk about the fun stuff, the money, the sexy stuff. Why is he talking about this boring stuff that I don't want to talk about? It goes down. Hey, guys, when you watch the video of me doing 20-point checklist, 
Do I talk fast sometimes? Yes. Do I talk slow sometimes? Yes. Do I talk really slow sometimes? Yes. Do I have pregnant pauses? Yes. Do I laugh? Yes. Do I make sad noise? Yes. Do I, do I whine? Yes, I do. There are places in there I whine. So it is a lot. Communication is not just what you say, but how you say it. Ask questions and encourage them to solve the problem for you. Again, don't tell, tell, preach, or teach. Any permit with risk must be made by them. This allows you to read their mind. This allows you to read their mind. Will people say something? You know, I, I give this example why we don't like the word yes. When we first got into sales, did our sales trainers tell us that we're trying to get people to say yes? Get them saying yes soon and often. Has anybody ever heard that saying? Get them saying yes soon and often. Have you, is that, say, give me yays or nays of that. When you first got into sales, did you hear your sales trainer tell you that you need to get them to say yes soon and often? Did you ever hear them say that? And when they say yes to me, do I like it or do I hate it? When they say yes to me, do I like it or hate it? I hate it. That's right. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Why? Because yes means what? I don't know what yes means. Because if I'm, if I live next to a neighbor and he loves, he loves the uh, New, England, New England Patriots and I hate the New England Patriots, but boy, when New England, New England Patriots are fans, they are, they are fanatical. Do I want to get into an argument <clears throat> with my neighbor? No, I don't. Someone get so I'm out tr trimming my hedges. I'm out trimming my hedges, and he's going on and on and on about the New England Patriots. Do I do I start uh, correcting him and disagreeing with him, or, or do I just say, "Yep, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, no, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, no, I get it, yep, yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, 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 yep." I disagree with him. I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight. But if he tells me, "Why do you love the New England Patriots?" Now, can I physically make myself say something good about the Patriots? If I'm a Giants fan and I hate the Patriots, I might say, yep, 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 whatever to, to them because I don't want to get an argument. But if they want me to actually say something that I, I, I do not agree with, will I do that? No, I find it almost physically impossible. My, my stomach knocks up. My breath knocks, uh, uh, locks up. I can't say something I don't believe in. That's why we know that when we do open-ended questions and they're telling us things, it's allowing us to read their minds. They're, they may say yes to something that they don't agree with, but they won't give me a, a, a complete sentence. They won't give me a complete sentence agreeing with me unless they actually agree with me. Do you think I'm out to lunch there, or is that the way you work? If your wife is saying something you disagree with, you say, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yep, 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 yep. But when she wants you then to uh, promote something that you disagree with by explaining to her what, again, you're trained at God, but if you're not trained at God, if you're not uh, trained at overcoming objections, do you physically find it difficult? Saying yes is easy because in your mind, like, yeah, for an idiot like you, or yeah, for whatever, because you don't know any better. Yeah, because, you know, you finish the second part in your head, right? Say yeah out loud, and then you say, because you're ignorant in your, in your head. You say yeah out loud, and then you say, because you don't know any better in your head. But when they say, okay, now don't just say yes, I want you to explain to me why that's right. Can you physically make yourself do that? Or do you, again, if you're trained, I can do it, why? Because I've been trained 20 years to do that. But before I was trained, could I do that? No, and can you, are your clients trained? No. So will they actually pontificate on something they don't believe? No, they will not. They will not. Because of that, when they tell us something, I can believe them, and that means I can read their mind. They'll, verbal, they'll never verbalize something they disagree with. And when they verbalize it, they own it. That's why we use who, what, where, why, when, how questions. This gets them from wondering what to do next uh, uh, to, to knowing what's going next. And if things aren't going well, what do we do? You pause the meeting, like I explained here earlier, where I just said, you know, I'm sorry, whatever I did to perturb you, blah, 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 blah. I pause the meeting. I do not go forward hoping again. Because, guys, if a meeting is going badly, do I just hope it goes better, or do I have to address it right then and there? I have to address it right then and there. So I blame myself, I fall on the sword, and tell them it's my fault in order to move forward. Does that make sense? So do you see how 
all the weird ways that I talk and the weird things that are in the scripts and the weird things I ask you to do are actually not that weird. I ask you to do them because they work. Not because I tell you the work, but because there's research, there is science, there is proof. The FBI has spent millions of dollars learning how to do this stuff, and we do the exact same stuff that they do. Now, I never knew that. I did not know that they were using the same stuff <clears throat> that I teach you guys, because I've been te using it since 1997, teaching it since 2000. I didn't actually see this guy until about 2015. So for 15 years, 16, 17 years, I was using it without knowing that we were doing the exact same thing. But the same reason the FBI uses it is the same reason we use it, which is, is science-based. It works with the human psychology. Make sense? Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for being on today. You guys have a great rest of the weekend. We'll talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody.